have a full house here today. Lots of children. That's good. It's great to see so many children and adults too to come out and to worship the Lord together. And that's why we're here. We want to worship the Lord. So, first thing we're going to do, we're going to have a little test and see who remembers what we talked about the last time I was teaching children's lesson. Does anybody remember where we were reading from the Bible? Yes? That's right. We're reading from Genesis. We read about the creation. Part of it anyway. We haven't finished yet. We're going to uh, read a little bit more about it today. So, one more really important question. I hope everybody knows it. And you can all just shout out the answer. We're going to have a little quiz to see who, who remembers about the creation. So, it's going to be a true or false question. Do you guys know how this works? True or false? Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm going to say something, and it's either going to be true or false, and you have to make sure everybody in here knows whether it's true or false, because otherwise they might leave not knowing if I told a lie. So, in the beginning, this is the question, okay? Or you have to tell me if this is true or false. In the beginning, when God created the earth, he created a huge bin of Lego, and from the Lego, he took all those pieces and put them together, together and made the world that we live in now. True or false? false? A little louder so everybody can hear. False. false. Does anyone remember how he made it? Do you remember what he used as the building blocks to make, <coughs> excuse me, to make it? Yeah, go ahead. That's right. He spoke. He spoke, and that was... That was the blocks that he used to build the whole world, was his words. And who remembers who was with God in the beginning? We talked about that a little bit too. Yeah? Jesus. That's right. It's, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God was plural. There is God as in the sense that we understand him in the Trinity, and we learn about that in, in uh, the Gospel of John too, that Jesus, the word, was with him. And the song that we just sung, I was thinking about it while we were singing, Man of Sorrows, and it's talking about Jesus and some of his characteristics. And, you know, you could barely, very easily add into that song a verse about Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who created the whole world. And he was there, you know, he was there, and it was his works, it was his work that created this wonderful wor world that we get to live in. So, so far in the story, we haven't finished the whole thing. We've seen God create the earth, and he created the land and the sky, and he made, separated those things, and he created light, and he separated the light from the darkness, and then he made something to rule the day and something to rule the night. One more question for you guys. Sun and That's right. The sun to rule the day, the greater light, and the lesser light to rule the night, the moon. And that's kind of where we left off, and we're going to continue, and we're going to talk a little bit about the last three days of creation, and they might be almost the most wonderful when we think of all the things that God's made. And we're reading in verse 20, for anyone who wants to follow along, or if you kids have your Bible, I see a couple Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. And it, the word says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth, in the open firmament of heaven. And we talked about that a little bit, right? The firmament was the sky. That's what he's talking about there. The birds are flying in the sky. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. And the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So a couple of things that we, that we see here, it was God created all the fish of the sea and all the birds of the sky and he created them in the same way that he created the plants. He made them, first of all, he spoke them, but he made them in a special way that they, they reproduce after their kind. So a bird doesn't make a fish, and a fish doesn't make a bird. A fish makes a fish, and a bird makes a bird. And that might seem a simple thing to understand for us here, because it seems like even nature would teach us that, right? When we look at fish and birds, and if you guys have animals, you know that the type of animal you have makes another animal of the same type. But, you know, there's a lot of people in the world that think from fish came everything else. That from a fish came a cow, and from a fish came a bird. And, you know, it sounds pretty silly when you say it like that, right? But, you know, it doesn't change when you say millions of years in between. It's still silly. The Bible teaches us that things come after their kind. And uh, I think that's the way nature teaches us uh, that earth exists as well. Now, I'm sure we've all seen some pretty interesting creatures. I'm going to open it up again to see if anybody 
has any interesting things that they want to share about God's creation. And maybe I'll start so you guys have an idea. Has anybody heard of the anglerfish? A couple people have heard of the anglerfish, one. So it's a fish that lives in the deep sea. It lives so far down into the ocean that it's like black. You can't even, if you were that far down, first of all, we couldn't live that far down without a submarine. But if you were that, that far down, there's no light at all. The light is all filtered out by the water. And there's a fish, it's an ugly looking critter. And it has the longest teeth to a fish's, to an animal or in nature, its body that exists. So it's a little fish and it has teeth that are like big and long like this. Just a nasty looking little creature. And they call it an anglerfish because it has a little dangly thing in front of its mouth that has a little glowing light. And that's how it eats. So the different creatures are attracted to that light and then they come and look and investigate the light and then it snatches them up with its big scary teeth and eats them. Oh, those are pretty neat too. Well, there's, you know, the one thing that I thought was really interesting about the anglerfish that I wanted to share was kind of the purpose that God created it for. And you know, I don't know if we really know the purpose that God created that fish for, but I think maybe the whole purpose of that fish was just to glorify him. Because did you know, do you know when that fish was discovered? It was discovered in 1968. Now, it's possible that one of those fish died before 1968 and washed up onto the water and somebody would have seen it, but it's very possible that nobody on earth had ever seen that fish before 1968, not even Adam. That that fish was in the bottom of the ocean, completely separated from mankind, so that we would have never seen it. We would have never looked at that fish and said, whoa, look at that creature. God is such a wonderful God who made that really interesting creative creature. And it was just in a world that we couldn't get to until they made submarines and things like that. And now we get to see those things in uh, documentaries and things like that. And we get to enjoy those things and we can say, wow, God is so creative. Look at that incredible thing that he made. It's a little scary and creepy and we don't know why he made it like that, so scary and creepy, but God made that thing. And the only thing that it did, it lived at the bottom of the ocean, swam around and ate other fish until 1968 when we discovered it and we could see it and say, wow, that's pretty neat. I kind of think that's cool, that God made that, and it existed for so long and just did nothing really but glorify him. It just lived down there, and he was the only one that really got to appreciate it. Does anybody else have something really neat, like a fish or a bird that they can think of? That's a, kind of a, a special thing that God created, yeah? A frog fish? What does it do? Oh, wow. What was it called? Frogfish. A frogfish. Oh, that's pretty neat. It camouflages, and I guess it must be a pretty good hunter. You know, there's other fish like that. A cuttlefish. Has anyone, anyone seen a cuttlefish? It's like a little miniature squid. Really, really cool. You should look these things up one time if you, your parents let you, with your parents maybe. But these fish camouflage. They can make themselves turn until it looks like just a weed floating so their enemies can't see them. And you know, God was the one who created those things. And part of this, the... What's so special about the creation story is we can look at it, we can read it, and we can understand that God made these things, and then we can understand that he did these things for his glory. He made these things so incredible, so, so intricate, so special, because it glorifies him. And when we see it and we say, wow, God, this creation that you made, this is awesome. That is honoring to God. He's glorified when we worship him because of the incredible things that he made. So, anyone else want to share one more real quick, maybe? You can't even see it. Camouflage is a really neat one that God made. They things that can just blend in without being seen. Well, why don't we keep going? We'll, we'll uh, read a little bit farther. So after he made those things, in verse 22, it says, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let fowl multiply in the earth. So God blessed that creation, and he blessed it to fill up the whole world, to fill up the seas, and to fill up the sky with creatures after their own kind. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. In verse 24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and every living thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. 
So anybody else want to share? The, it's, you know, it's very similar to what we read in the last few verses. This time God made the things that were living on the land. Cattle, so we're maybe, I think he's talking about all sorts, obviously every creature that exists on the land, but cows and sheep and those things and creeping things like lizards and spiders and centipedes, the things we don't want to look at and just squish under our heels. No? There's a lot of people that don't like snakes. I like them too. But anybody have a kind of an interesting creature that they want to share about that lives on the land? Yeah, you know one? The vibrations? Yeah, they, God made some creatures that can sense, sense things differently than we can. When people walk, it makes little vibrations, and then it jiggles their tummy a little bit, I guess. They have sensors that they can feel it, and then they know people are coming, I guess. That's kind of neat. Yeah? That's pretty cool too, eh? It would be a little strange for us to use our tongue to smell. We can't, we can't understand what that feels like. We can only imagine it. We can, we can imagine what it must be like to lick and, and experience the atmosphere that way that snakes do. But you know, and that's the purpose that we want to reflect on these things is to understand that it's not just because these animals are cool. They are cool. They're very cool. They're special. But the reason that we think about these things is because it's God who made them. And God, when God made these things, he didn't just do it in passing. He made them for a special purpose, to glorify him. And when we see these things and we can say, wow, God made that. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing that God made. And we can say, God, you're so powerful. You're so special. You're so creative. What a good God you are. And all these things should, should make us worship him more. Do you know, in Romans, do you know what the Bible teaches us? That there's a lot of people in the world, basically everybody who doesn't know Jesus, that they worship the creature instead of the, cre instead of the creator. They worship the creation. So they see the things that God made. Like they see some of these very powerful animals like a bull. And they say, wow, God. They say, wow that bull is so strong. There must, be, there must be some power in this animal. And we're going to build an altar and worship it. And they worship the creator. Or the creation, sorry. And there's some people, they see the sun. And they would say, wow, that sun is really bright. And it gives light to the whole world during the day. They say, you know, we're going to worship that sun. There have been lots of people that did that. And that's very dishonoring to God. Because all those things that God made, he made them just with speaking. And people would rather worship those things than the creator. They'd worship the creation rather than the, cre than the creator. And uh, what we want to do is we want to see those things and understand that he made those for his glory to honor him. And when we do that, it does honor him. He's glorified when we say, God, you are good. You are powerful. So let's keep reading. Verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Hmm, that's very strange. He says, let us make man in our image. Now, if God's talking, how can he be saying our? Yeah, Luca? That's right. It, was, it wasn't just God the Father. It was God the Father and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know, there was the whole counsel of God was there making the world. And when he made man, he said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So when God made man, he made the male and female, and he did something special to them. He differentiated them from the rest of his creation. And he said, man, you are going to have dominion. You're going to, you're going to have rule over all the other things that I've made, all the creatures, that is. You're going to have rule over all the cattle and creeping things, even little ants and things like that. And maybe I don't understand how we're going to rule them, but they're all subject to man's rule in a way. And, and God has made man, maybe the most noble creature is the way, and he's made us different than those animals. And we'll get into that a little bit more in chapter 2. That when he made man, he didn't just make us like the rest of the creatures. The rest of the creatures are just kind of dumb animals in a way. Not to be crude, but they're just, they fulfill their purpose. They eat and they make more animals after their kind. But that's kind of the extent of their purpose. But God made man to rule the rest of the creatures. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, when, when we say that God created man in his own image, how do we understand that? Do you think that, well, maybe I should just put it this way. 
<clears throat> the Bible tells us that God is a spirit. We all know that, that God isn't just some uh, big gray bearded man sitting on a throne in uh, some place in the clouds. Like it says the Bible tells us that God is a spirit and that if we want to worship God, we have to worship him in spirit. And I think that's when he says we're, he's made us in his image. I think this is kind of what he's talking about. He's talking about the special part of us that the animals don't have as well, and that's our soul, our spirit. And again, we're going to look at that a little bit more in chapter 2. But he's made us spiritual beings in a way that he didn't make the animals spiritual beings either. So the animals are just flesh and bone, whereas people, mankind, he's made us special. We're not just flesh and bones. We actually have a spirit. We have a soul. And this is the thing that I believe that God made us after his image. And uh, because of that purpose, that's how we can be different from the animals and we can actually glorify God. We can say, God, you are good because we have a spirit, because he's made us after his likeness and in his image. Verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Sorry, rereading there. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, which is the... <clears throat> And every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So, well, we'll read the next verse here. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So, did you know what all the creatures in Adam and Eve, what, when he made those things, do you know what they were eating? We'll see if somebody else knows yet. Bugs? Well, actually, they weren't eating bugs yet. No. That's right. When God made, when he first made the heavens and the earth, did you know even lions ate plants? Did you know even sharks? Well, I sh maybe not sharks, because it actually says, the Bible says, to every beast of the earth and fowl of the air, and thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb, for meat, and it was so. So he actually didn't say anything about the fish of the sea, but all the animals that were on land and in the air, he made every green herb for them to eat, including people. So before, um, before Adam and Eve sinned, all they were eating was plants. They were eating fruits and vegetables and things like that, and they didn't get to eat meat. Now when I hear that, I'm a little disappointed. Yeah, I've got a couple meat eaters in here too. Yeah, I like to eat meat. So it doesn't really sound like paradise, but who am I to say? I'm sure God knows much better than I do. I'm sure if I just ate plants, maybe I'd enjoy them a lot more. Yeah? That's right. But we could have pineapples and other tasty things like that. Lots of, lots of tasty things to eat, I guess. But <clears throat> anyway, that was in his original creation. There was no meat eating because nothing had died yet. There was no death. Death was something that actually came later. And if none of the animals died, and God had told man to eat other things, well, then they just they ate the plants. They didn't eat any of the animals. <coughs> now, there is something interesting about that, too, is that in some of the other places, in Isaiah and places like that, God actually talks about the lamb and the lion dwelling together. Because did you know one day God will remake the earth? Right now, the earth is, is in, a, in a state that's not perfect anymore. In the next verse, God says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So during that time, everything was good. And when I read that, I kind of think that there, if everything's good, then there's nothing bad. I think that's a pretty safe thing to say, right? And I think we can say that death is bad, and sin is bad, and all these things are, they're kind of not good things. But when God originally made the earth, he made it perfect. Everything was good. And uh, that's kind of... In a way, that's, uh, that's the ideal. That's the perfect world that God had created. But when Adam and Eve sinned, that all changed. And the earth wasn't perfect anymore. And there was bad in the earth. It wasn't all good anymore. But the Bible teaches us that one day, he will make the earth perfect again. He's going to destroy the whole thing with fire. And it sounds like a pretty bad thing. And it's kind of a scary thing to think about. But he does it with a purpose. He's going to destroy the earth because he wants to make it again. And he wants to make it again perfect. And he, in the... During that time, the Bible teaches us that the lamb will dwell with a lion. Now, we know that's not now, because what would happen if you put 
a hungry lion in with a little lamb, what do you think would happen? I'm pretty sure, right? I think he'd enjoy it too. Yeah. But uh, there's going to be coming a day when God makes the earth again that it's going to be just like it was, at least similar to like it was in Genesis, where those animals wouldn't eat each other. They'd actually dwell together in peace. And I th correct me if I'm wrong, somebody who's older and wiser than me, I haven't looked this up, but I think in that same passage it talks about a child and a snake being together. What mom would put their, would put their baby together with a rattlesnake? would put a rattlesnake in a baby's bassinet or something like that. Not very many, right? That wouldn't be a very good thing. But there's going to be coming a time, and even here in the Bible, if there was a baby, you could have put the most poisonous snake right in there with it, and it would have been totally fine. They didn't attack each other. There was no death. It was just peace. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Well, we're finished the chapter, and uh, maybe we'll save chapter 2 for the next time. So if you kids want to go and have a seat,